As we move to Matthew chapter 5, let's do a quick review of uh, what we just studied in chapter 4. We saw in Jesus in chapter 4, we saw the beginning of chapter 4 where Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit and was tempted of Satan. And then we saw how, how Jesus overcame temptation that Satan threw at him. And he came, overcame that temptation through, through the Word of God, by using the Word of God, obeying the Word of God. So many times we like to say that Jesus overcame temptation by uh, uh, quoting script, Scripture. Well, he did more than quote it, he obeyed it. And it's one thing to memorize Scripture, it's another thing to obey it. Remember, Satan also used Scripture when he was tempting Jesus to do wrong, to sin. And so we see Jesus overcome temptation that Satan throws at him through simply uh, quoting Scripture and then obeying Scripture. And you and I have the same ability. We have the same. We don't have to be Jesus to overcome temptation. So we see Jesus led into the wilderness by the Spirit. He's hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days, and he is tempted. Remember, we are tempted and we are weak. Um, when we are weakest, uh, the temptations come. That's when the attacks come greatest, and Jesus was weak. He was hungry. Forty days of fasting, he was literally uh, knocking on death's door at 40 days of, uh, of fasting, of no food. Um, the body is eating in on itself at this point in, uh, of the fasting. So, so we see Jesus move from uh, the temptation that comes to him uh, by way of Satan. He overcomes that temptation. He gives us the example. Jesus gives us the example of overcoming temptation and then Jesus moves into his uh, public ministry and then he calls four of his disciples he calls um, he calls Peter and Andrew and then he calls uh, James and John the the sons of Zebedee and he calls them out and then he goes around healing uh, the multitude doing miracles uh, miracles were always Jesus performed miracles M remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan Satan wanted uh, Jesus to perform to him, uh, miracles uh, as a sideshow, um, uh, to, to, to perform his way into meeting his own needs. And Jesus was not going to do that when he performed miracles. He did so to prove that he was God and that he could, he could forgive sin. And, um, and he demonstrated that over and over and over again. Matthew chapter 4 ends with the great multitudes in verse 25. Matthew 4, 25 says, and great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So people from all over the area, even beyond the Jordan, had heard of Jesus and they were following him. And they were the crowds and the masses were, were uh, just seeking after him. Some curious, some, some of them sincere, some not, some following him to see how they could uh, catch him, uh, trick him. Uh, to, to catch him in a lie, to prove that he was uh, a false messiah, to prove that he was not God. Many wanted to prove that he was of Satan himself. Uh, so not all the people who are following after Jesus, and we'll see that in different points, not all those people were on his side. So we move into chapter 5. Chapter 5 begins what we call the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are a, uh, it's a <clears throat> the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus goes up and it says, see, in verse 1 in Matthew chapter 5 states, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, And now what Jesus is getting ready to teach them at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is what we would call the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are a list of, of teachings uh, that he gives us. Um, they're, the, they're, they're just a different way of living life. Um, if we could say this was uh, uh, counter to everything that they had, were being taught, um, the culture was teaching, that religion was teaching, um, this was a, 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 a Christianity, this was a, uh, a form of living that was going to be what we would call counterintuitive. Uh, to how we believe that we should live life. Jesus is going to say, he's going to use the word over and over, blessed, 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 or blessed, happy. That word blessed means happy, but it means happy in a, in a much more strong sense than you and I would think of the word happy, okay? Um, 
it, because it's not based on always on circumstances. This is this is based on uh, an attitude. This is based on how we approach things, how we see life, how we see ourselves. Um, that that has to come from within inside of us. If we're always waiting for circumstances and what's going on around us to make us happy, um, then then we will ride the roller coaster of our emotions and, and of life, um, and, and we end up being a mess. And so that's that's not how God intended for us to live. He did not intend for us to ride these emotions like a roller coaster. Uh, he intends for us to keep the proper perspective on life, a great attitude about life, no matter how bad or good things are. When things are good, I should be humble, and I should not take the credit for the great things that are happening in my life. When things are bad, I have to understand that God is allowing bad things in my life. He's allowing these things to grow me, to test me, to, uh, to, to make me a better person, um, no matter how bad they may seem. And, and we need those things in life because we don't tend to push ourselves in life uh, very hard. Uh, we said before, that's why you need a good, why athletes need coaches. Even the best athletes in the world need, need, need a coach because that coach is going to push them further than that uh, world-class athlete is going to go on his own. Um, Tiger Woods swings that golf club 10,000 times a day, uh, not because he wants to, but because his coach makes him do it. He's got to have somebody who to pushes him. So anyway, let's read through these and, and then we'll come back to them. He says here in Matthew chapter 5, he says, uh, I'll start in verse 1 again. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, so Jesus is always teaching. You should always be learning. You should, we should always be learning. Uh, all the time you should be seeking to learn, 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 learn to grow. So Jesus taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, blessed are those who hunger after, uh, and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And verse 12 says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So these are again what we call the, uh, the Beatitudes. Um, and we're just going to kind of walk through these. These are the first 12 verses of, of uh, Matthew chapter 5. And as we go through these, we probably won't get through all of Matthew chapter 5 in this one, in this one video. Uh, but I'll keep referring back to, to my notes here. Um, as we said, Jesus is teaching, teaching the disciples. This multitude of people has followed him to to the mountain. That's why we call this the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Mountain. And this is, the Beatitudes is just one part of it. We'll continue to see in the next few chapters, Jesus lay out this, this Sermon on the Mount. It's a rather long sermon that he, that he preaches here. So, so he starts off with, blessed are the poor in spirit. As we said earlier, what does blessed mean? Blessed means happy, but it means, it doesn't mean happy like you and I understand happy, where again, our circumstances, hey, if things are going good in our life, we're, we're happy. Right now it's raining behind me. You can't, I got the blind shut a little bit, but it's raining. Uh, I'm not too happy about that. I'm not, uh, but, but I understand we need the rain. I understand, I'm thankful for the rain, even though I don't want it to be dreary out, even though I don't want it to be raining today. I have to be thankful for the rain that we so desperately need, even though I'd rather have sunshine and, uh, um, and, and dry weather. Uh, but uh, it's raining, and I'm thankful for that, even though I don't, I don't care for it so much, right? So blessed are the poor in spirit, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say blessed are the poor. I see people all the time, whether it's on social media or, or they speak this, or they say, well, the Bible says blessed are the poor. No, it doesn't. It says blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a big difference between uh, somebody being uh, poor physically or monetarily and somebody being poor in spirit. To be poor monetarily is not necessarily a blessing. Um, we certainly can uh, go, 
uh, there might be times when we are, are lacking money, um, but it's always, if we're providing for our families, providing for loved ones, we don't want to stay in a, a state of poverty. We, we, we need to uh, make more money, or not saying we be greedy. There's a, there's a balance there. We're not being greedy, but we have to meet needs. Um, so this is not talking about a, somebody who is monetarily poor. The Bible is not saying blessed are the poor. If you're going around saying that, you're wrong. Okay, um, there, are, there are rich people who are blessed and there are poor people who are blessed. So uh, we have to be very careful about that. So he's saying blessed are the poor. Poor, here the word poor means to be a beggar. It doesn't, it's not somebody who uh, in the sense would have a job and they're not making enough money. This is a person, the idea here is poor is a person who is uh, completely bankrupt. Uh, they, have, they have nothing. They have to beg for everything. Um, sometimes we'll say, well, the, well, the working poor, they have a job, but they still have income coming in. Well, the idea here is this is a person who is spiritually bankrupt. There's nothing they can do about their spiritual, spiritual state. And that is all of us, all of us. There's nothing you and I can do about our spiritual state apart from God. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, so I recognize blessed, the ha happy is the person, blessed is the person who recognizes that their spiritual state is one of bankruptcy. I am completely bankrupt in my spiritual state apart from, apart from Jesus. All right, so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So when the person recognizes, when I recognize that my spiritual state is one of being bankrupt, uh, then when I recognize that, now I can start to do something about that through Jesus Christ. But until I recognize that I'm spiritually bankrupt, I'm not going to be blessed. So I have to recognize the fact that I'm spiritually bankrupt. Um, he says, because when you do that, then what's the result? Yours, you, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven until I recognize that I am spiritually bankrupt. And, and the kingdom of heaven is not just heaven itself. It is here on earth as well. You and I as Christians, we're a part of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Remember, John the Baptist said that the, the kingdom of heaven had arrived. The kingdom of heaven was Jesus. And when you and I become Christians and we're in Jesus Christ, we're part of that kingdom of heaven. So we experience the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Remember, Ephesians tells us that you and I dwell in two places. We, we, we dwell here in, in, on earth and the city you're in, if you're in whatever town you're in, you're, I'm in Macon, Georgia. If you, uh, so I have a resident here in, in Macon, Georgia, but I also have a resident in heaven at the same time. At the sa Jesus, God, sees me in two places at the same time. He sees me as part of the kingdom of heaven here on earth, and he sees me as part of the kingdom of heaven in heaven itself. Right now, at the same time, God sees me in two different places. Now, I may not feel like that. I may not recognize that. I may not look like it, but that's what God says. Um, he says that we are, he recognizes that. So he says, so blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that apart from God, they are spiritually bankrupt and there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, the only, only one who can do anything about it is, is Jesus Christ. And he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So because of your impoverished spirit and you recognizing that you have an impoverished, bankrupt spirit, and that you need Jesus to do something about that, then you'll be blessed. Then you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So the, number, the, first thing, the first part here is what blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that they're spiritually bankrupt and that they need a savior. They need Jesus. Okay. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the second one here. The second, uh, the, the second uh, beatitude is, uh, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So when I recognize something, that I am spiritually bankrupt, there should be a mourning. There should be a, a oh no, what am I going to do about this? This is a, this is a, a recognition that uh, 
that there's a great concern on my part now. I, I, I am mourning over the fact, I am, I am agonizing over the fact that I have a spiritual condition that I myself can, can do nothing about. So therefore, I'm blessed because I mourn over that, because I'm recognizing that, that, that now I can, once I recognize there's a problem, you see, I can't fix a problem until I recognize that there's a problem. And then when I recognize the problem, I'm gonna go, oh no, what am I gonna do about this problem? I'm gonna agonize over this problem. Second Corinthians seven ten, Paul kind of repeats this same the same idea in Second Corinthians seven ten, where he says this for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So uh, he's comparing two different sorrows here. There's a there's a sorrow of the world where man, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not. Uh, I don't like what's happening in my life, you know, and I agonize over what I'm not getting from the world. And that produces nothing in my life. I will be chasing that forever. I will be chasing what I think the world has to offer me. And that go and the world keeps moving the goalposts, keeps moving the goalposts back and back and back. Every time you think you have success in the world, something else comes along. Somebody's doing better than you. Somebody's looks better than you. Somebody uh, feels better than you. So there's a better job. There's a better woman. There's a better car. There's a better house. There's a better whatever. You know, there, there's always something better out there that the world's going to say you need, and you're never satisfied with that, and you're just chasing it, and it just the sorrow that it produces and the agony that it produces as you chase this world, it produces death. That's what Paul says, where God says, look, if you'll chase me, when you recognize that and agonize so you're recognizing that you're poor in spirit and then you're agonizing over the fact that you're poor in spirit you're blessed because now you're going to do something about it now you're actually going to put your feet to the fire you're actually going to pick up the the tools that you need in the word of god and apply that to your life and do something about your corrupt bankrupt spiritual state and that's what he's saying here he says blessed are those who mourn for for they shall be comforted god's going to offer you uh, a comforting now. He's going to offer you a, uh, a way of escape uh, for your poor spiritual state. So he says, number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Number two, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be, they shall be comforted. Uh, God's going to, now that you recognize it, he's going to come in and he's going to, he's going to show you the way to do something about it. He's going to show you who Jesus is and he's going to, He's going to explain to us through his word how Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin that we can't do anything about. We brought, we're born in this sinful state. Uh, we're rebellious by nature. Uh, just take a look at your life. I take a look at my life. I, I'm a rebel. I'm a rebel at heart. At heart, I, I'm just a rebel. And so are you. And uh, our hearts are just rebellious. And there's nothing that we can do about that. But Jesus Christ can change that hard heart. He can change that rebellious heart when we truly recognize our poor spiritual state and we truly mourn and agonize over what we are and what we have become in our lives and the decisions that we have made that, get, that maybe got us to the point where, where we are. Man, Jesus says, I can, I can do something about that. So blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Now, uh, meekness is uh, not weakness. As a matter of fact, meekness is often defined as a powerful personality that's under self-control. That this is a person who, who is able to control through the power of God now uh, because they have recognized their poor spiritual state. They have mourned over this. They recognize their need for, for Jesus and that they can't do anything to fix their lives right? So now they, their, their, their humility is overflowing. This is a humble, humble state of somebody in a powerful personality. Jesus was a powerful personality. Jesus Christ was God himself, but even in his, human, in his humanity, uh, he was a powerful, powerful man who operated in meekness and humility. And it says here that the meek those who will humble themselves, uh, they shall inherit the earth. God is going to make sure that you get what you need 
and he's making sure you get more than what you need. He, the, this is the idea here, this, this idea of, an, of inheriting the earth. Um, once we control our desires, once we place our desires under, under the power of Jesus Christ and under the power of the Holy Spirit, he will not leave you short. God will not leave you, he, he will not give you the short end of the stick. That, that's basically what he's saying here. God's gonna make sure that you get everything that you need and, and a whole lot more. God wants to bless you. Bless. Remember, this is the word blessed, happy. This is more than you and I can do ourselves. This is more than the world can give you. It's going to be greater than anything that you have ever experienced in your life. But until you recognize, until we recognize that we're poor in spirit, and, and, until, we, until we recognize that, uh, that, that, that we need to be mourning over, over our, our, our rebellion and our sin uh, until we recognize those things. Um, we're, we're not going to receive these things. We're not going to receive these things. So he says here, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are, who are just humble and, and recognize that there's nothing that, uh, in and of myself, I, have, I didn't wake up this morning and, and, and start my breath up. I didn't wake up this morning and start the blood flowing through through my veins. I did not wake up this morning and do any of those. Those things were already happening in my life. Those things were already there. Uh, I did nothing to to make sure that I was alive and breathing this morning. It was already done for me, and I have to thank God every morning, every day that I'm up and I'm alive and I'm breathing and he he's he's providing for me and he's he's moving me along. I didn't create the dirt that that allows us to grow food. Um, I, I didn't create the universe. This is all here uh, by God for me to use. And, uh, and, and, and until I recognize that without God and without his creation and all the things he provides for me, I'm nothing. I have nothing, I'll be nothing, and I'm going nowhere until I recognize those things. I, am, I have to be meek, I have to be humble and recognize that uh, in and of myself, I have nothing, I am nothing, and I will go nowhere. But with God, I am something, and I'm going somewhere. Amen. So, okay, so blessed are the meek, uh, for they shall inherit the earth. And then finally, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, Jesus had just come. Remember, he had just come off of 40 days of, of fasting. And when he says hunger, he means hunger. He, he, knows, what, he knows what hunger is and was. Uh, we live in a culture today where we really, in, in America, even amongst the poor, we, we really don't know what true hunger is. Um, the, we have all of our needs are met through various, if we can't afford food, food will be provided for you. We truly don't know what hunger is. And uh, in this culture, hunger was real. There's a lot of people who went days without eating. The poor were poor. Um, they were just completely impoverished. Um, so the, the, when Jesus says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they're, they're seeing this in a whole different way than, than you and I are seeing it. Okay, It doesn't mean they've gone and missed one meal. They may have missed days worth of, of meals. They understand when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This means they have a, a, a zeal, a passion, they are, they are over the top uh, pursuing righteousness. Um, there's an intensity there that, uh, uh, that, that, that we don't experience uh, a lot of times like we need to experience when we're hungering and thirsting for something. Think about something that you're passionate about. Think about something that you get intense about. Think about something that you just... You, you just chase after and chase after and chase. God says, whatever, whatever it is you've been chasing, you need, to, you need to redirect that passion, redirect that intensity, and start chasing his righteousness. Um, how many times has the, has the addict, what will he do? How, how passionate is he about chasing down the substance that he needs, the alcohol, the pornography, the, whatever the addiction is? How passionate are you or are they about going after these things and will, and will move heaven and earth to get what they need? So we have to redirect that passion and put it towards chasing after God in that direction. 
Uh, however hard I chased after wrong things, I got to chase twice as hard after right things because it's easy to chase after wrong things. It's easy to chase after things that are not good for me. It's easy to do that. Anybody can do that. It takes effort. It takes passion. It takes intensity to chase after the things that are going to bring me my greatest success. It takes passion and power and intensity. It takes drive. It, it, it takes um, discipline to do that. And, and, you, and you've got to be ready to put those things into your life so that you can chase after righteousness. And, and they hunger and they thirst for righteousness. And what is the result? They shall be filled. Do you feel empty? Is your life empty? There's so many people who are chasing things in life. They're chasing after money, power, women, cars. They're chasing after drugs, alcohol. They're chasing after the next piece of property. They're chasing after the next dollar, the next client. And they're chasing and they're chasing and they're chasing and they're never filled because they're not, they're chasing the wrong things. Again, nothing wrong with pursuing things to feed our families, to make money, uh, to, to be able to save for the future. Is as long as it's not a heart, it doesn't control my heart, as long as it doesn't become your God, right? Jesus says, and he's going to say in Matthew 6, you can't chase God and mammon or money. You can't chase both of them. You can't chase both of those. When you chase after righteousness, those needs will be met. God will bring the needs. He'll, he'll meet the plus so much more. You're doing things the hard way. Stop doing things the hard way. Stop doing things the hard way. You think, you think, you think you're doing it the right way and you're doing it the wrong way. Stop. All right. So he says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be, they shall be filled. Okay. What is righteousness? Righteousness is chasing after the things of God, chasing after what he says is right, chasing after what he says uh, is, is honorable and glorifying to him, chasing after those things and denying the things of the flesh, denying the sinful things that, that we so badly want to chase. Then he goes on to say in verse 7, Blessed are the, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, we all like to have mercy shown to us. So if you want mercy shown to you, you have to, you have to display mercy. So many times we, we don't like to have uh, well, we don't like to display mercy, but yet we want mercy shown to us. So if we want to obtain mercy, if we want mercy in our lives, then we have to be merciful towards, towards others. Um, so if you want mercy from God, you got to be merciful towards other people. So show them that mercy. Show people that mercy. Don't get revenge. God, God says revenge is up to him. You, we're so busy trying to go after people we don't like or people that have hurt us. And he says, no, that's not your job. Your job is to love them and let God take care of the revenge piece of it. God will take care of that part. Your job is to, is to love and show mercy. That's counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what we want to do. But we got, that's, that's what he says to do. So if you want success in your life, you got to do what he says and not what you think you need to do. Okay. So blessed, number eight, or verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, a person who's pure in heart is now a person who's received Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they're now pursuing after those things of righteousness. And when you pursue after those things of righteousness, he says here in verse eight, they shall see God. Well, what does that mean, they shall see God? Well, they'll get, a, they'll get an extra measure of God. Uh, they'll experience God in a, in a greater way. There's plenty of people out there who claim to be Christians who aren't pursuing righteousness. They're not showing mercy. They don't mourn over their sin. They don't do any of those things. And, and, and they're not experiencing God on a level that they could be experiencing God. But if you want to experience God on a great, great level, uh, then, then you have to be pure of heart. You have to First of all, A, know Jesus Christ as your Savior. B, be pursuing the righteousness that he says to be pursuing. You need to be showing mercy to other people. You need to be loving other people. You need to recognize that you, in and of yourself, you're nothing, you have nothing, and you're going nowhere. And then when those things happen, you'll get a greater measure of who God is and what he can do in your life and a greater blessing, and you'll experience God in a, in a greater way. 
and that, that's what we should all be pursuing. Well, God wants us, well, God wants to give us him in a greater way, but he also wants you to experience him in a greater way. And to know when you start to experience the power of God in your life, like you've never experienced before, you'll never go back. It's greater than anything you'll ever experience in your life. Paul said that he chased after the power of his resurrection. Resurrection power. There's no other power on it. You cannot duplicate resurrection power in this world. Resurrection power can only be duplicated inside of God. And he says, that's what's in you. Resurrection power. It doesn't mean you can go around and raise the dead, but that's the power that resides in you. Because when you, when you and I do pass away from this world, we will be resurrected to him in heaven. You and I will live again. We, you and I will have an eternal destiny, an eternal place, an eternal home in heaven with him. Live like it. Live like God is doing something in your life. Live like it. Talk like it. And walk like it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Finally, he goes on in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. How are your actions out there around your friends? How are your actions? Are you a peacemaker? Do you speak truth even when others don't? Do you, do you speak what God says even when others won't? Do you walk the way God says when others are not? And, uh, whether you're in the workplace or where, wherever you are, are you doing those things? Because he says here, people are going to call you, they're going to call you by what you're doing. So blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Uh, people are going to recognize you for, they're going to recognize who you are by what you do. And if you act like a fool, they're going to call you a fool. If you act like you're a peacemaker, and that you're, you're a son of God, they're going to they're gonna call you that. Now, they may not call you that, uh, because they admire you. They may call you that because they don't like you. They may use it as an insult. And that, that's what he goes into here, here pretty soon. He says the, next, the very next thing he says in verses 10 through 12 is, Blessed are those who are persecuted for what? For righteousness' sake. Because you are walking like God and with God and by God and for God. And you're going, you could be persecuted. You could be ridiculed. Uh, you, for, for that say that's okay. If people ridicule me for, uh, for, for representing God, I'll take that. I'll take that all day long. I will take being ridiculed uh, because I walk with God and because I, I walk in his righteousness and, and, and I'm, I'm a peacemaker and I'm doing all those things that, that he says to do. I'm pure in heart. I'm mourning over my sin. I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm poor in spirit and, and that I, I constantly need God all the time. If, if that's what I'm going to be persecuted and name called for and maybe fired from a job for and, and unfriended on Facebook or social media, you know, that's fine. That, that's okay. If, if that happens, then I'm okay with that. If people reject me because I represent God, that you're ble God says you're going to be blessed for that. You're gonna, there's going to be some rewards for that. So take it. Take, take those lumps. That's what he says here. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for, for my sake. Rejoice. Rejoice in it. Be happy about it. Say, woohoo, all right, man, somebody just ridiculed me. Somebody just called me a name. Somebody just unfriended me. Somebody just uh, uh, spoke bad about me. Somebody spreading rumors about me because I represent and walk with God. Great is your reward in heaven. For they, for they so persecuted the prophets and the, uh, who were before you. They persecuted the prophets. They persecuted Jesus. They killed Jesus. I don't... I don't see anybody trying to put you on the cross for walking with God. And if somebody's not trying to put you on the cross right now, or somebody's not trying to kill you for your for your uh, for your uh, uh, relationship with God, then what are you worried about? God's going to bless you. He's got something for you. He says, rejoice in it. 
because he's going to bring something greater. Stop thinking this world has something for you. The only reason that you don't like it when people talk bad about you because you walk with God is because you're more concerned about what the world thinks about you than what God thinks about you. we got to be more concerned about what God thinks about us than what the world thinks about us. So he ends this part. He says here, he says, Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and they will persecute, and they'll persecute you. So we're going to end right there. We're going to end right there in verse 12. So that's the first, that's the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We'll pick up verse 13 on the next video. So remember, uh, some questions here for you. Uh, uh, how, how, how is your life compared to, to these Beatitudes, these first 12 verses here? Is, are, you, are you blessed? Um, are you more concerned about the world and what the world thinks about you? Or are you more concerned about what God says about you and what God thinks about you? What are you more concerned about? Do you recognize that you're poor in spirit? Do you recognize that you have a great need for Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you recognize that? Are you mourning over that? Are you humble about that? Uh, are, you, are, you, are you living the blessed life? Because here, he, he says the blessed life is completely different than what we think it is. The things that bring the blessed life to us are not the things that the world says bring the, the, be, the blessed life. The blessed life is the best life. So go out there and have a blessed day.